Developing news overseas, the U.S. continuing its aerial assault on the terrorist group ISIS in Iraq. American warplanes and a drone launched four more airstrikes today with the goal of trying to help refugees trapped by the violent group that has gained control of much of the country. Tonight, the president is sending a message that there is no timetable as to when these airstrikes will stop. New at 11, breaking their silence, the Class A shareholders of Market Basket releasing a statement they are now offering to help fund Arthur T. DeMoulis' purchase of the company if he does not have enough money to close a deal on his own. We want to take you live outside the store in Tewksbury where, yes, another protest is getting underway as we speak. You see people gathering there with signs in the parking lot. You also see Janet Wu reporting live this morning. Janet? As she said, the store shelves may be empty, but this parking lot is full as they are getting ready to rally. Hundreds and hundreds of employees here angry over the firing of their beloved CEO, and they have new reason to be angry. Over the weekend, eight longtime employees were fired for attending a rally last Friday. And meanwhile, this growing feud really affecting customers. Let's head live to 7th Janet Wu with the breaking news desk. Yep, a lot's been happening this morning, just hours after President Obama gave the go-ahead. Fighter jets dropped bombs on Islamic militants. They specifically targeted caravans towing artillery outside Erbil, a strategically important city that serves as the Kurdish capital. There is also a U.S. consulate there, and the president has vowed to protect it and any U.S. personnel. It continues to be surreal here. It's now been more than eight hours since this tragic event, but things are just so different than what they should normally be. Let's take a look off to my left here. After those explosions, they basically cleared this scene with about 40 minutes. They got every single person, runner and spectator, off of Boylston Street. As you can see, it is just desolate tonight. Let's talk again about those explosions. We were about a block and a half away when they happened. It was just before 3 o'clock, a little more than four hours in into the marathon, and that means a large uh, amount of that field of runners was at that point making their way to the finish line. Because these are all, you know, kind of mid range runners. And by the way, you can hear behind me barriers being moved for more emergency vehicles to go through. That's the noise there. Anyway, the first bomb, just a shock. People thought a cannon might be going off for some celebratory reason. But when the second explosion, the second bomb went off, it was unmistakable that something horrible was happening. It is unknown why so many dolphins come ashore here. One factor is believed to be the tricky topography, the Cape, which acts as a kind of trap for these animals. And the number of strandings so far this year is staggering. Another day, another dolphin found dying or dead. So many are coming ashore now, rescuers are no longer waiting for the calls. It's not prudent to wait anymore because we've had so many strandings right in a row. We're staging our teams uh, out in the field. We're actually departing now before low tide to be out in Wellfleet, which is our hot spot. Every day, crews from the International Fund for Animal Welfare gear up, drive to Wellfleet, and wait. Every single day this week, more dolphins have been found. We're very tired. We're, 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 uh, we've been going from January 12th, and uh, the team is actually just exhausted, and uh, so it's, it's almost a, a daily event now. About 200 animals strand themselves on the Cape each year, but not all of them dolphins. So this sad phenomenon is baffling scientists. So far, 129 dolphins have stranded themselves in just over a month, 80% of them here in Wellfleet. Of those, just 37 could be saved. 92 dolphins have died. It's in fact the largest single species stranding that we've had in, in this area of the U.S. A sad battle rescuers can barely keep up with, let alone win. And IFA is calling in crews from the aquarium and other places for mutual aid just so their own folks can get a single day off. And another crisis is brewing. Because of the number of strandings, the organization has almost exhausted its rescue budget for the year. Reporting live from Wellfleet, Janet Wu, 7 News. Surveillance video shows heavy traffic and a Volvo pulling into the gas station. Screaming out loud for letter words and, and gassing it as fast as I could. His wife was in labor. They were in traffic. I seen the driver come go to the passenger side. I didn't know what he was doing. I had no time to panic. His neck was a little twisted, so I lined it up his head. And the second I did that, he just came right out.
A customer and workers ran over to help. It was loud. It was born in the car. Yeah, you got to be loud. The ambulance arrived within minutes. And I took a peek inside the car, and mom was already holding holding the uh, her baby. He was still attached to the umbilical cord. We actually clamped in, allowed dad to come in and cut the baby's umbilical cord. We're in the Ponset Circle with people driving by into work, so there's very little privacy. It took about 10 minutes to make sure mom and baby were okay, and then they piled everyone in this ambulance, including dad, and drove them to Mount Auburn Hospital, where they were trying to go in the first place. Very helpful screaming. As a matter of fact, I don't think I really needed to use a siren on the way to the hospital because that baby screams so loud. While the family stays at the hospital, Alton is watching their car. Probably going to need to detail it. <laughs> and his new son already has a new nickname. His full name is Peter James Heffernan, but he'll be forever shell to me. In Dorchester, Janet Wu, 7 News. 7's Janet Wu is live at Children's Hospital with this story. This young one's name was Esther Earl, and John Green, who wrote The Fault in Our Stars, called Esther his muse. He met the young woman as she was being treated here at Children's Hospital for cancer. Esther means star in Persian. The dedication simply reads to Esther Earl. What's your name? Hazel. And what's your full name? Hazel Grace Lancaster. Esther Grace Earl was born in Beverly. Her family was living in France when she became ill. All of a sudden, she started com coughing mm -hmm. and complaining that she was getting tired. The Earls returned to Boston for her treatment. The avid reader then struck up an unlikely friendship after meeting author John Green at a Harry Potter fan convention. She was hard to miss because she pulled an oxygen tank and had a nasal cannula and kind of reddish short hair. John was writing about pediatric cancer, but scrapped that for a story inspired by Esther. I could see Esther and I could I could hear her voice. John Green last saw Esther just a few weeks before she died. He came here for a visit and he gave her this rose, which the family has kept. Hey, so Grace, take me. On Monday, the family joined him at the premiere of The Fault in Our Stars. The love story is fiction, but Esther and the movie character were both the same age, bravely fighting the same form of cancer. It was like Esther Grace, and it was, it was hard to watch the story unfold, but also a joy because it celebrated life, and it celebrated uh, love, and it celebrated, celebrated friendship. We always called her Star because Esther, Esther means uh, star. Sadly, Esther died in August of 2010, shortly after her 16th birthday. Her family then started a foundation called The Star Will Never Go Out to help other families of kids fighting terminal cancer. The Fault in Our Stars goes into wide release today. Reporting live from Children's Hospital in Boston, Janet Wu, 7 News.